One night, when the sky is filled with brightly shining stars, just outside what appears to be a castle, we see massive destruction like there was just a battle there. Suddenly, a hand emerges from the rubble, and the man underneath pulls himself out. A voice talks about how a star that doesn't shine in the highest peaks of the night sky, and is stuck under the ditches where nobody looks, is still a star if it wishes to shine, and still embraces light in its heart. Clearly, they're referring to the man who just rose out of the dirt. The man uses his sword to get back to his feet, and gasps for air in the cold night. The scene shifts, and we see the man standing in front of a building, staring longingly at the sword placed on a wall. His bright blue eyes gaze at the blade as it sparkles like magic, and he talks to himself about how cool the piece is no matter how many times he looks at it. He's interrupted when a voice calls out to him. With an annoyed look on his face, he turns to the person who brought him out of his daydream. The lady, whose name is Zemina, claims that she knew she would find him there, staring at the sword like usual. We finally learn that the man's name is Vlad, and as Zemina wears a condescending look on her face, she reminds him that he's been lost in thought lately. Hearing this, Vlad gets upset and warns her not to get on his nerves, pointing out that she's currently interrupting one of the few breaks he has. However, Zemina doesn't seem to care if he gets mad, and just informs him that his behavior is the reason people have started spreading rumors about him. Vlad is shocked to hear that people are talking about him, so he asks her to explain what she means. The girl gets nervous when she realizes that she just accidentally let such sensitive information slip out in her outburst. So, rather than answering him, she just looks away from him and changes the topic. Zemina suddenly asks Vlad if he still hears voices in his head whenever he picks up a stick. Vlad doesn't reply and just stares into space instead, so she concludes that he still hears voices, and curiously wonders what kind of sins he committed in his last life. It appears that for some reason, Vlad was struck by lightning on a clear day, and on top of that, it was black lightning. As rare as such an occurrence is, Zemina advises Vlad to stay cooped up in the shop for a while, claiming that the new bishop is said to be very sensitive about omens and similar stuff. She reveals that he used to work as a heresy inquisitor, and as such, he has a keen eye for supernatural stuff. This puts Vlad in danger, because if the bishop finds him suspicious, he would immediately be sent to the stakes to be burned. Hearing what she has to say, Vlad is even more downcast because he knows that his life is in danger. He feels bad that she would tell him something like that. But Zemina explains that she only did so because she's worried about him. She reminds him that many people saw him get struck by lightning, and reveals that since then, they've all been talking about him behind his back. She then advises him one more time to stop showing himself to the public by moping at the sword all the time, because the church could take him away at any time. However, Vlad ignores her counsel and insists that he won't get dragged away like a criminal just because he stares at a sword. He says this while looking at the sword in question, and Zemina finally gets fed up, calling him dense and suggesting that he just buy the sword since he likes it so much. As you'd expect, the sword is expensive and way out of Vlad's budget. But when he explains this to her, she claims that it couldn't be that pricey. She believes it's just the work of a back-alley blacksmith, and even offers to buy it for him, thinking that she could easily afford it. After a brief pause, Vlad reveals that the sword costs five gold, and judging by Zemina's reaction, she finds the price ridiculously high. She doesn't think a stupid piece of metal should cost that much, and starts to think of all the other things she could get with five gold. Vlad smugly helps her finish the thought, pointing out that she wouldn't have to work for a whole year if she had that kind of money to spare. Just then, a voice cuts in and grabs their attention. It's an angry old man, who heard Zemina call the pricey sword a stupid metal chunk. The man insults them, and tells them to get out of the place. Judging by his outfit, he's a blacksmith, and he didn't take her comment lightly. The angry man tells them that the sword isn't for back-alley kids like them, and sends them away. However, Zemina isn't one to back down from confrontation. She asks the man who would buy the sword if they don't, pointing out that it's being sold in the slums, so only someone living in the slums would end up purchasing it. After making her point, she taunts the old man further by asking if he's out of his mind. Rather than being mad about the question, the man is more offended that she called him old. He gets even more furious at her, claiming that she has no manners. The fearless redhead just makes things worse by suggesting that he only makes swords for knights, because he's old and would probably soon kick the bucket. At this point, there's a giant vein bulging out of the man's head as he sees red. He snaps at her, claiming that she's correct before calling her a dumb kid, and advising her to go back to her shop and do the dishes. Semina finally gets a taste of her own medicine, feeling offended that he called her a kid. She retorts that she's a grown lady, and as tensions start to rise, Vlad takes her away from the argument before things get out of hand. He pulls her out of there, telling her not to get worked up. But Zemina is fuming, because she doesn't think she said anything wrong. As the two walk away from the old man, he continues to throw insults at them, calling Zemina rotten and full of venom. He thinks back to when she was younger, and blames himself for giving her too much food when they had nothing to eat. The old man notices the footprints Vlad left behind, and surmises that he was standing there for a long time. 
he thinks about how Vlad should focus more on making ends meet, rather than daydreaming. The blacksmith takes down the sword and decides that he's going to finally let it go and sell it to someone who can make use of it because he knows that slum kids never grow up to make it out into the world. The blacksmith holds the precious sword which happens to be his last work and thinks about how it's just like Vlad because they both shine even in a place like the slums. Zooming out, we get to see the center of the northern economy. It's a place called Soara and it's regarded as the lighthouse of the northern region thanks to the power of the Bayezid family. However, even this place of brilliance harbors dark shadows found in the slums, where all foul things are thrown. Inside a tavern, we see men drinking wine and chatting with women. The fun is interrupted when a shirtless man pulls a lady by her hair, insulting her for trying to scam him. The woman denies trying to scam him, so he reveals that she tried to sell him fake medicine. He claims that he knows it's fake, because he's worked as a mercenary for 20 years. Just then, Vlad arrives at the scene after hearing the noise. The mercenary identifies him as the candle maker and tells him to go get his madam. Vlad blankly tells him that if he wants to see her, he would need to pay gold coins rather than silver. Hearing this, the man is enraged that they would demand gold when their business isn't even run properly. He tells Vlad to bring his mom if the madam isn't available and accuses him of scamming him with the candle that measures the time, claiming that it burnt down too quickly. Vlad hits back, suggesting that the man should have paid for a longer session if he wanted to have fun and advises him to climb into his wife's bed instead. The man gets angrier, so the boy decides that he can prove the candles weren't a scam. He even tells the mercenary that he can do whatever he wants with the woman if it turns out that they cheated him. The man is reluctant to accept the terms, claiming he can't trust scammers, but Vlad insists and promises to beat the crap out of him if the candles work fine. His blue eyes begin to glow ominously, and the mercenary gets frightened. He then lights the candle and stands there, waiting to see if it goes out before five minutes. Sure enough, the candle goes out at the five-minute mark, and before the merc can know what's happening, the boy hits him straight in the face with his wooden staff. As the man falls back, Vlad exclaims that the candles are fine after all and proceeds to kick him in the back and push him into another room. He locks the door behind him and tells the man that he's dead. The terrified mercenary holds his bloody nose and begs Vlad to wait, but the blue-eyed fellow just proceeds to beat the living daylight out of him. He continuously strikes him with the staff for trying to scam the shop and especially for talking about his mom without respect. The young man beats him so hard that the noises can be heard outside the building. The next morning, at breakfast, Vlad tells a man named George that someone messed with their candles. When the madam hears this, she's outraged and wonders who would dare do such a thing. She then assigns Vlad to find the culprit, but he doesn't know how to. Confused, he asks her how he can do it. And the madam, named Marcella, merrily reveals that she has already found them. It turns out, she was the one who messed with the candles, so she could scam the drunkards and make more money. I have to say, for a woman of the night working in the slums, this woman is a real gem of a beauty. Hearing her confession, Vlad is dumbfounded, thinking about how he beat up the fat mercenary for nothing. As he walks down the stairs, he shrugs off the guilt, believing that he had to do it since he's just an employee. This is when he's approached by a group of men, and the ringleader of the lot commends him for what he did the last night. The guy wraps his arm around Vlad's neck and pulls him closer so he can ask him for some money. He heard that Vlad got some tips from selling candles last night and claims that they needed some money because they're all broke. Vlad snaps at the guy named Burley, and his eyes start to glow once again. Burley teases him, telling him not to get scary, and explains that he's not just asking for money. He's just here to make a fair trade. Hearing this, Vlad is perplexed, so Burley reveals that he has something to give him in exchange for some money. Suddenly, he pulls out a little boy by the hair and claims that the kid is a stupid and unskilled pickpocket. Vlad recognizes the kid, and Burley offers to give him back in exchange for 40 silver. Vlad immediately asks about the kid's fingers and ankles, so Burley assures him that he didn't cut them off but only taught the thief a lesson. Eventually, our hero gives Burley and his goons the silver and then states that they should just kill the pickpockets next time rather than come to him. The kid is terrified to hear this, but Burley claims that him and his gang aren't murderers. As they leave, Vlad reminds Burley that he's scamming his family and co-workers, but the guy is just excited that he managed to exploit someone using the vagrant kid. After they leave, our hero scolds the boy named Ned. The kid apologizes, claiming that he tried to play it safe, but Vlad just tells him to leave after confirming that he didn't break any bones. Ned thanks him before leaving, and afterward, our hero thinks about how his dream of acquiring five gold has just been postponed once again. Later, Vlad visits a man named Harbin, who works for Captain Hoover, more infamously known as the Whale Hunter. He tells the man about Ned and how he didn't lose any fingers. That seems to surprise Harbin, as he recalls the time when he lost his fingers and got his ankles cut for stealing. Young Vlad and Zemina watched him bleed, and he ended up becoming a public lesson for everyone else. 
He then reveals that he heard that the candles were messed with, and Vlad is surprised how he already knows about that incident. Harbin explains that the rumors have been making the rounds that Marcella is cheating the customers, but he doesn't think she's that kind of a person. Vlad claims that he also thinks the same, but reveals that George already seems to know about it. Harbin suggests that even if they were messing with the candles, they would have a very good reason to do so. Perplexed, Vlad asks what reason they could have, and the fingerless man explains that they most likely need money urgently. On that note, he warns Vlad and tells him to be careful, because there's only one reason an organization would need to rake in money quickly, and he claims that it must be because they're planning a war against another organization. George, the whore's knight. Black Bear, the swine butcherer. Dice, the gambler. Captain Hoover, the whale hunter. And one-armed Jack, the money buck. These are the five bosses who dominate the slums of Soara. All the darkness of life now slowly approaches Vlad through the shadows. Vlad is in grave danger, and this becomes very evident when Moneybug and his gang come to his shop, looking for his boss. Vlad just stares at him in bewilderment. He can't believe that Moneybug himself would come to the shop. He fixes his gaze on one-armed Jack, and wonders if the preparation for war have started already. He's drawn out of these thoughts by one of Moneybug's subordinates yelling at him. The ponytailed guy with a scar on his face calls Vlad a brat for not responding to Moneybug and asks him where his boss is. Immediately, a frown appears on our hero's face, and he tells them that he doesn't know where the boss is because he's just a candle seller. Mr. Ponytail seems to have a very short temper because he insults Vlad again and smashes the table while threatening him. The force from his punch sends the candles flying, but even at that, Vlad remains unfazed. He just stares the guy down, showing that he isn't afraid. The workers, on the other hand, are terrified, especially the ladies watching the entire altercation. They all watch with their jaws on the floor, waiting to see what happens next. Suddenly, Vlad gets on one knee and begins picking up all the expensive candles that fell to the floor and got broken. He even tries to get the Ponytail more riled up by suggesting that he's closed for the day. Hearing this, Ponytail is visibly irritated and frustrated that the young man keeps ignoring him. While picking up the broken candles, he suddenly tells the guy to get his feet away. He finally pushes the guy to his limit, so he tries to kick him while he's on one knee, but our hero just uses his trusty wooden staff to strike his leg in midair. Ponytail loses his footing, and with bold determination, Vlad lands another powerful strike on his face. It sends him falling to the floor, and everyone watches as gobsmacked upon seeing it. Money Buck, on the other hand, appears to be amused. With his glowing blue eyes, Vlad glares at his defeated opponent and holds the staff against his face, representing the back alley's unchangeable rule, which is that the winner stands up high, while the loser lies down below. Seeing this, Moneybug's men are outraged that he would do that to their colleague in front of them. They're about to charge him, when Moneybug tells them to stop. The boss waves his hook in front of his men, and they're confused as to why he isn't letting them fight. The towering man explains that he actually likes Vlad, and he even proceeds to applaud the candle seller. Even though he has only one hand, he is so impressed that he can't help but clap for Vlad. He implores him to be more understanding of the noise, and the candle seller just replies saying that he doesn't discriminate against the disabled. This dude has no chills. Rather than getting offended, Moneybug finds the comment hilarious and immediately bursts into laughter. He tells Vlad that he would like to have a private chat with him later. The red-eyed boss touches the young boy's face with his hook and asks to be reminded who he took away before, but Vlad just retorts that the person must have died early since he can't remember. Their little exchange is interrupted when one of Moneybug's men calls out to him. Both of them turn around and are surprised to see George and his men standing before them. George teases Moneybug, claiming he would have served him grilled meat if he knew he was coming but the mountain of a man just dismisses the gesture, reminding George that they're not that close. Regardless, George regards him as his guest and suggests that they go upstairs. Jack claims that he would prefer good liquor over meat, so he asks for some to drink. The knight's green eyes glow scarily as he assures Moneybug that Marcella doesn't disappoint when it comes to hospitality. The intruder's red eyes glow with the same murderous vibe as he suggests that they have a taste of the liquor if that is the case. One of Moneybug's men helps Ponytail back up and the boss and his men make their way upstairs. After the tension is toned down, Vlad heaves a sigh of relief, thinking about how he almost died a few moments ago. Later, he finishes gathering all the broken candles and wonders how many the ponytail asshole broke. He's drawn out of his thoughts when Moneybug calls out to him, referring to him as a shining star. Looks like the boss and his men are heading out after their discussion with George and Marcella. The man admits that Marcella and George had only good things to say about Vlad, and while claiming that he has also seen his potential, he asks him to come for him whenever he grows tired of smelling burnt candles. He assures that he would appreciate someone like Vlad working for him, but the loyal candle seller replies that he doesn't mind staying at his current job, especially since they pay him, feed him, and put a roof over his head. Hearing this, Moneybug just laughs in response, pointing out that he can do the same and more. 
but seeing that Vlad wants to stay there, he tosses him a gold coin as compensation for the broken candles. Our hero is undoubtedly taken aback upon seeing it, and responds that it's too much. The man with the hook still insists, and offers him a lot more of those gold coins if he decides to work for him. After the mouth-watering offer, the man reminds the young man about his title, the money bug, and thanks George for the delicious meal before leaving with his men. Our boy notices that the intruder looked extremely cheerful, and wonders if the meeting went well with the rest. That's when Zemina calls out to him from upstairs, and informs him that George wants to see him. Later, we see Vlad, George, and Marcella in the same room. Vlad stares at something speechless, and as we see that it's a precious knife, George reveals that he was planning to give it to him later. However, since the circumstances call for him to pass it over earlier, he's decided to give it to him now. He tells Vlad to keep the dagger with him at all times, and as the blue-eyed boy receives it, he can tell from the mood in the room that George's and Moneybug's conversation was most likely a total disaster. He looks all over the room and sees all the men brooding with low spirits. Even Marcella is in a foul mood, so he knows that some trouble is brewing. This is when George also tells Vlad that he should stop selling candles. Confused, the boy asks what else he should do if he can't sell candles. Sensing his anxiety, George reveals that they got a tip about one-armed Jack bringing in people from the outside into the slums. He believes that the men are mercenaries who used to be knights, and Vlad chimes in to remark that the men are just like George. With a worried look on his face, George confirms it, implying that he is afraid. The thing is, one-armed Jack already led an overwhelming number of dangerous men. But even then, the former knight George was too much of an obstacle to overcome, since he was like a wolf inside a flock of scared sheep. However, since Jack has brought in mercenaries and swordsmen who are individually as skilled as a knight, the balance keeping everything together before has now been destroyed. George admits that they're already at a disadvantage, and explains to Vlad why they need him on their side. Vlad, however, is surprised that they regard him so highly. George informs him that he will be given his first mission soon, and the information takes him so off guard that he's visibly dumbfounded. Overwhelmed by the situation, Vlad thinks about Harbin, a disabled man without fingers, who also lost his ability to walk. But against all odds, he used his clever mind to teach himself language and mathematics. Those were the skills that opened doors for him and allowed him to rise through the ranks and now work under Captain Hoover. Vlad uses Harbin as his role model. He realizes that he can learn through effort and that the knowledge will take him to higher places. While the young man is practicing with his wooden staff, he starts to hear a voice again. The voice suggests that he narrow the angle of his elbow as he swings down, and Vlad gets pissed off that the voice is back. I guess you're now wondering how he started hearing a voice in his head whenever he's training. Well, it all started one month ago, after he was struck by the jet black lightning. Ever since then, the voice, which he considers as demonic whispers, starts echoing in his head whenever he holds a sword or something similar. Frustrated, he tries to block out the voice, claiming that he would first need to buy some holy water before even thinking about getting that sword from the blacksmith. He struggles to ignore it and decides that he won't reply to it at all. And so, he holds his staff again and tries his best to focus his mind and strength to strike down. But just when he's about to do it, the voice interrupts his thoughts yet again, telling him to narrow the angle of his elbow. He accidentally listens to the voice and is surprised to see that the result of the strike is significantly better. In fact, he realizes that the strike followed the path of a sword, a road that can turn him into a master if he walks down on it. He feels as if he's holding a real sword, and finally starts to wonder what the hell has made its way into his mind. Is the voice in his head just a recollection of memories or a past life? The scene shifts to somewhere in the cold snowy mountains, and we see a man cleaning the blood off his sword. He talks about how one can't fool experience, and admits that he can now feel how cold the winter air is in his bones. Judging by his outfit, the man is a knight. He hears noises coming from the bushes and surmises that someone is hiding in there. He smirks as he suggests that the person hiding is either stupid, or being stupid on purpose for trying to fool him. The white-haired knight walks towards the source of the noise and asks whoever is hiding to come out. There's a brief pause, and after a while, a voice replies to him, asking if he's Sir Stanga. The scar-faced knight sees the person and immediately identifies him as the one they call Vlad, after seeing his unique blue eyes and blonde hair. Sir Stanga reveals that he's heard about the guy from the slums, especially because people have been talking about him a lot. He comments on his blue eyes and blonde hair, claiming that those who didn't know any better would think he's a noble. Vlad doesn't say anything about that, but just goes straight to the point of his visit. He gives Sir Stanga a sealed letter from his boss, George. The knight opens the letter, and upon reading it, a small smile of amusement appears on his face. Sir Stanga reads that the opposing organization has a mercenary who used to be a knight, and finally understands why George needs his help. Seeing that the knight is on board, Vlad informs him that he will be his guide back to George, and suggests that they should arrive at their destination in two nights. Vlad turns around, expecting Sir Stanga to follow him, 
but the knight just teases him, claiming it wouldn't be a good idea to follow the lead of someone as stupid as him. Hearing this, Vlad explains that he's capable of at least guiding him back to meet George, however, Sir Stanga doesn't think so. He tells the young man that there's no way he can be smart when he's doing something so stupid. Vlad starts to get offended, but the knight just glares back at him with his purple eyes. At this point, our hero doesn't know what to say to change his mind, but Sir Stanga finally agrees to follow him. However, he swears to kill him if he forgets any routes on the way back. Vlad glares at the knight as well, but just tells him to try and keep up, explaining that he wouldn't want to screw up his first mission because of him. The blonde-haired guide turns away for the second time and begins walking, leaving the knight baffled that he didn't even seem intimidated by him, even when he intentionally made himself look threatening. In fact, Vlad blatantly ignores his threats, and it amuses Sir Stango a bit because he concludes that it's his boldness that makes George like him so much. The knight hasn't spent a lot of time with our hero, but he can already tell that he's a child worthy of being nurtured. Later that night, the duo stops at a small cave to rest for the night. They start a fire and just sit there in awkward silence. After a while, Stanga notices that Vlad keeps looking at him from time to time, so he gets uncomfortable and confronts him about it. He asks the young man why he keeps looking at him like it's his first time seeing a retired knight. The kid sheepishly admits that it is in fact his first time seeing one up close. Sir Stanga asks Vlad if he's a country bumpkin, but in response, he asks the retired knight where he's from. Stanga tells him he's from a place called Dikia, and Vlad exclaims, commenting on how that place is so country. The knight finds it a bit offensive and quickly changes the topic, reiterating his earlier threat to kill him if they get lost along the way. With a very mean look on his face, he warns Vlad not to lose his way, and promises to slice him in half if he does. However, just like before, our boy isn't even slightly frightened, he just tells the knight not to say such scary things either way. While unwrapping some beef jerky he brought with him, Vlad reveals that he once heard that all jokes made by knights are threats. Sir Stanga doesn't even reply to him, because he's more interested in the meat. He admits that it looks very fresh, and asks the young man if his share is in there somewhere. Our hero responds that George didn't give him much, and asks him if he doesn't have anything to eat. Stanger replies that he does, revealing the small few pieces of meat he has as he looks at them in dissatisfaction. Vlad then puts his meat on sticks, and begins to roast them with the fire. The smell is so good that Sir Stanga's mouth starts to water just thinking about it. In his desperation, he offers to answer any question Vlad asks him in exchange for a piece of jerky. He then tells our hero that it's a rare opportunity, and urges him to grab it. With a mouthful of meat, Vlad looks at him curiously, contemplating whether or not to take the deal. Eventually, he breaks the silence and blankly asks Sir Stanga how many pieces of jerky he wants, explaining that he should just ask if he wants some. Stanga gets offended again, so he explains that his pride won't allow him to do so. He reveals that knights only get something when they give something in exchange, before folding his arms and closing his eyes, implying that he isn't ready to compromise. Seeing this, our boy reminds him that he's a retired knight, however, Stanga reveals that he's gone by that belief all his days, and isn't ready to change that now. In the end, Vlad decides to ask him his name, and he responds. The kid then asks him his age, and the knight reveals that he's 42 years old. Stanga suddenly realizes that Vlad hasn't given him any meat in return for the answers, so he calls him a brat. Our hero just ignores him once again, and proceeds to ask the next question. He asks the retired knight if he knows how to use aura. Upon hearing this, Stanga smiles and admits that Vlad only looks innocent on the outside because of how much he knows. Stanga then tells him that not all knights are able to wield aura, and explains that using aura is a different thing entirely from just possessing it. Our hero senses that Stanga is trying to dodge the question, so he blankly asks him again whether he can use aura or not. The knight smiles and then hesitates, causing Vlad to become so anxious that he even offers to give him all the beef jerky in exchange for his answer. After wasting a little time, Stanger reminds Vlad that a knight should only take something when he's given something in return. As such, he decided to show him something special. He pulls out his sword and grips it tightly in front of his body. He then closes his left eye, which has a scar on it, and our boy asks him why he's closing it. Stanger responds, telling him that it's because he needs to bring forth his world from deep within his soul. With the eye still closed and beginning to glow with a magical blue color, the knight tells our hero to watch him carefully. Just then, the sword begins to glow as well, and Stanga tells him that this is the essence of knights. The bright blue light starts beaming even more, and the aura shines so much that Vlad is forced to cover his face. Later that night, the both of them make their way to a city. The retired knight complains about feeling gross, but Vlad tells him that it's better if they look dirty and inconspicuous than look like knights and draw attention. However, it turns out Stanga isn't even talking about his appearance. He laments that he's actually talking about his mood, and explains that he has a lot of pride as a knight and doesn't like the idea of them passing through a hole. He asks Vlad why they have to go through there, so the guide explains that he was instructed to escort him back in secret. 
If they go through the main gate, their arrival won't be much of a secret. But even after Vlad explains this to Stanga, he still grumbles like a five-year-old. The young man encourages him to keep moving, and promises to prepare a bath for him when they arrive at their destination. While walking through the secret passage, Stanga points out how quiet it is and admits that it bothers him. Vlad replies, telling him that the place is dead silent because it's that time of the night. Just then, the two stumble upon something that shocks them. Before them are several dead men. Stanga asks if the place always has things like this, and of course, our boy responds that it doesn't. Looking at the corpses, Vlad figures that the men probably fought each other. He suddenly suggests that they split up, and promises to tell Stanga where the secret back door is, which is used strictly by the members of his organization. Hearing this, the knight looks concerned about him, and asks the kid where he will be going. Vlad then reveals that he would be passing through the main gate, claiming that it would be wiser to split up the attention. As Vlad starts walking away, he tells Stanga that they will meet up later. After some time has passed, our hero arrives at the shop, and is shocked to see the place has been turned upside down. And then, he sees a wounded George with bandages all over his body, and Marcella is standing by his side and tending to him. When the Horse Knight sees Vlad, he commends him for making it back safely. Unfortunately, he also reveals that Moneybug attacked them first. He had already anticipated that, because he knows that those who hold money are usually on another level of strength. A worried Vlad looks at George, asking him if he's okay. George admits that it's been a while since he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone on the same level as a knight, and because of that, he ended up getting injured quite heavily. However, the former knight is less concerned about himself, and more interested in whether he was able to bring Stanga with him. Vlad reveals that he found him, but that they had to split up because the main gate was being watched. He then adds that he told Stanga where the back door was, and speculates that he should have arrived by now. George is pleased with the news, because he plans to attack Moneybug the next day, and hopes to end things for good. He also asks Vlad how Stanga looks, hoping that he's currently in fine shape. Our boy confirms that the retired knight is okay, and admits that he looks like a good person too. Hearing this, George reveals that Stanga has a hearty side to him, and Vlad adds that he can also be quite nimble. The boss asks our hero if Stanga looks like he lost weight, claiming that one needs to look after himself to live a long life. Vlad then reveals that he knows Stanga can use Aura, and because of this, he believes they would be victorious in their battle the following day. Rather than cheering, George is shocked by the fact that Stanga possesses such strength. That's when Vlad hears footsteps, and figures that Stanga has arrived. But George calls him before he can leave, asking him if he's sure that Stanga was able to use Aura. Suddenly, the former knight grabs his sword and tells the young man to get behind him. In a shocking twist, George reveals that Stanga doesn't know how to use such power, and before Vlad can piece everything together, the so-called knight appears with his sword and coat covered in blood. The apparent imposter tells George that he's come to a very far place, before greeting him in a menacing manner, claiming that it's been a long time since they last sought each other. In a short flashback, we find ourselves back in the snowy mountains. It turns out that while the imposter was cleaning the blood on his sword, he was actually talking to someone he'd just killed. He tells the man that he can't fool his age, and suggests that the winter wind may have gotten into his bones. It was at that moment that he heard the noise coming from the bushes, and went out to find out that it was Vlad. In the present, we see the imposter wearing a sick grin on his face, and telling George that he's changed a lot since the last time they saw each other. George asks him why he came looking for him now of all time, and in response, the imposter tells him that Count Gadar has passed away. Upon hearing this, George seems visibly shaken by the news. The imposter further adds that the news hasn't been publicly announced as a result of some complications, but assures him that soon, everyone will find out. The annoying purple-eyed knight pours himself a drink and starts to mock the deceased Count Gadar. He raises the glass and toasts to the pitiful Count, well aware that it would get on George's nerves. Sure enough, George becomes furious, and as he curses at the imposter, he pulls out his sword and charges at him. The other guy is unfazed and just holds the glass cup in the air as a way of taunting him, knowing that it would force him to try and attack him. Just when George is about to land a powerful hit on him, he dodges it so quickly that none of them can believe it. The attacker shatters the glass cup with his sword, and everyone else is bewildered by how fast the imposter moved out of the way. He then toasts to the new count, Sigmund, which multiplies George's anger by several folds. Not only did he mock the former count, but now he hails the new and most likely corrupt one. The already injured boss turns around and swings his sword at the imposter called Godin, but he blocks it with his own blade. As the two clash swords intensely, Godin reveals that Count Sigmund's first order is that the deserter knight named George should be brought back immediately. George declares that Sigmund isn't his lord, and so, he refuses to obey him. Godin admits that the Count didn't expect him to return without a fight, nor did he hope for his safe return. The two powerful sword swingers go back and forth with their duel, but Godin proves to be a lot more agile. He dodges George's attempt to strike his feet, before evading another powerful swing to his torso. 
As the fight gets even more intense, Vlad tells Marcella that it isn't safe for her to be there. While the heavyweights go at it, Vlad grabs Marcella and quickly leads her outside, helping her escape before she gets hurt. When they get outside, the men who are downstairs suddenly call out to Vlad, asking what all the noise upstairs is all about. Vlad spots Burley, and immediately orders him to get all the men upstairs at that moment. He also tries to explain the situation and inform them that their boss is in the middle of a deadly fight, but before he can complete his sentence, George is sent flying downstairs. Vlad and Marcella can do nothing but watch in horror as he plummets down below. The men downstairs are also too stunned to move, and they all watch George fall from the great height. Meanwhile, just when George is about to hit the floor, Godin bursts through the wall, wondering why George is still making the naivest choices ever. Finally, the boss crashes to the ground with great force, and as he lies there in pain, the men surround him, confused at what the hell is going on. Their murmurs are interrupted when poor George starts to cough. Godin watches from above as the former knight struggles to get back up, and his purple eyes glare at the boss as he waits to see what he will do next. Just then, a dagger is sent flying towards Godin's head, and it's not just any dagger, it's the one George gave to Vlad. Godin manages to block it with his sword just in time, causing it to bounce away and sink into the wooden floor. Vlad's blue eyes match Godin's glare, and after a short staring contest, the knight charges at the injured boss with his sword. As he jumps down to deal the finishing blow, Vlad yells for George to get out of the way before it's too late. The boss hears this just in time, and musters the power to leap out of there before Godin can kill him. He manages to dodge the strike, while the silver-haired knight sinks his sword into the floor. Afterward, George falls to his knees again and grabs his weapon. Godin gets back up, and asks him why he didn't just follow the orders he was given in the past. George replies, telling him that he couldn't carry out such terrible orders, because he's a human being with a sense of honor. Hearing this, Godin corrects him, reminding him that he's a knight and not just an ordinary human being. This makes George furious again, and he starts growling in rage. His men join him too, and when Godin sees that he's outnumbered, he decides that the night has dragged on for too long. The imposter closes his left eye and says that now he just wants to rest. Vlad sees this move and recognizes it, so he knows that Godin is about to use his aura. He runs as fast as he can, trying to stop him from doing it. But before he can get there, Godin's sword and eyes are already glowing, and the aura is activated. Blue lines start to appear on George and his men, implying that they are the targets of the attack. Unfortunately, they can't do anything to stop it, and the bright powerful energy that is released blows back our hero and kills all of George's men. By the time the dust settles, Godin is gone, and all of George's men are lying lifeless, covered in blood. Vlad groans as he gets back up, and is horrified to see the result of what just happened. Everyone else is dead, and all we can see is George's face dripping blood to the floor. Our boy is broken when he sees his mentor's demise, and thinks back to when he was younger. He remembers how George was the first to offer him a helping hand, when he was just a boy rolling in the back alley dirt. The knight was the first one to acknowledge Vlad, when no one else saw his potential. And as time went on, he became the strongest person Vlad had ever known. But now, that strongest person had been killed, and as the blue moonlight quietly approaches, we see Godin holding George's head in his hand. The imposter had beheaded the only father figure that our hero had ever known. Vlad stares at George's head, probably hoping that it's all a dream. But the more he looks, the more he realizes that his world has been shattered to pieces by this villain that he brought into his home. Devastated, he grabs George's sword and yells in utter distraught. But just when he's about to strike with the sword, he hears the voice in his head, telling him to stop at once. Regardless, he swings the blade with great force, but Godin easily dodges it. Even if the attack wasn't a threat, the knight is shocked to see that Vlad knew how to swing in the sword path. He's perplexed, because a gutter kid from the slums shouldn't know how to do that. I guess he doesn't know that this gutter kid was struck by jet black lightning. Regardless of his curiosity, Godin is impressed, and he admits it. Unfortunately for him, Vlad doesn't care if he's impressed, he only cares about killing him. The enraged kid charges him for the second time, yelling at him to die. Just then, Godin blasts him with an attack, but Vlad manages to quickly twist his body and deflect it. He finally gets a hit in, and it's so powerful that it sends Godin flying, even making him lose his sword. The imposter gets back to his feet, and is stunned by what he just witnessed. He concludes that Vlad must have been born with a gift, and believes that it's the reason he was able to instinctively twist his body, and deflect the attack. But even though the boy managed to deflect it, it's clear that his body got hurt from twisting and turning so quickly. He falls to the ground and groans in pain, but the voice in his head tells him to take it easy. It urges him to breathe, and not to lose his focus. Vlad holds the side of his stomach, and continues to groan as he curls up on the floor. Godin watches the kid struggle on the floor and thinks about killing him now. He contemplates snuffing out the light and potential Vlad possesses, but ultimately decides that it would be too much of a waste, even though he knows that the child could return with an even sharper sword. The knight thinks back to when he and George were still friends. 
George had once told him that he found pleasure in watching over those with great potential, and the memory pops a faint smile on Godin's face. He calls out to Vlad, who's still wincing in pain. He tells him that a knight only takes a fair price, and a perplexed Vlad asks him what he's talking about. Suddenly, Godin tosses back two slices of beef jerky that Vlad gave him in the cave. He tells him that his name isn't Stanga, and he's not 42 years old either. He explains that the boy got an unfair price, which is the reason he's tossing back some pieces to even out the exchange. However, he declares that he will still be taking George's head back with him. Vlad stares in horror once again at his master's bloody severed head, and listens as the imposter says that he would be taking it away, because it's a fitting price for him as the victor. He says this with arrogance and pride, staring Vlad down and waiting for his response. The heartbroken kid is filled with rage, and scowls at the imposter before vowing to kill him. Godin just scoffs at the statement, and looks away in disappointment. He tells Vlad that he shouldn't even think about asking for the second price for the beef jerky, especially with the way his life is at the moment. After that, Godin turns and starts walking away, leaving our hero fuming with rage. Vlad stays on his knees and tries to stand up. At this point, he's gnashing his teeth and stuttering as he vows to kill the bastard who beheaded his master. But the imposter just ignores him, and walks out of the shop holding George's head like a trophy. Vlad yells his name, but he's ignored once again as the knight keeps walking away with a straight face. He finally walks through the hole he made in the wall earlier, and our hero warns him of the day he would come back to kill him. The devastated kid repeats his promise loudly, and for the first time since the story started, we see him shedding tears. His bright blue eyes well up and glow, as he screams in agony with tears rolling down his face. After Godin's rampage at the shop, Zemina helps an injured Vlad get out of the place. She holds him up as he limps out and groans in pain continuously. Throughout, he keeps his hand placed on the source of the pain, and at some point, it stings him so much that he falls to his knee. Vlad just stays there, sweating and panting, trying his best to overcome the excruciating pain. The scene shifts back to a few moments prior, and we see that he's now back inside the shop. Marcella bluntly tells him to get up as he curls up like an armadillo. She asks him if he wants to die, but he doesn't even respond to her. The kid just stares into space and stays silent, implying that he might not even mind dying at this point. Marcella senses this, and gets so upset that she immediately slaps him hard in the face. She tells him to get his axe together, and then asks him if he knows what the difference is between the guys who live in the center of the city and those who live in the slums. Vlad doesn't know the answer, so he just stares at her like a lost puppy hoping he doesn't get smacked again. Marcella tells him that the difference between them is opportunity. She explains to him that those guys in the city can get back up, even if they fail once, because they can afford to do it. Unfortunately, for the losers in the slums like them, it isn't the case. Marcella tells Vlad to look around the wrecked shop filled with corpses of their own men. She asks him if they look like they can afford to fail as well, pointing out that the destruction is the result of just one failure on their part. She explains that they've been bound to a tragic fate that sentences them to death if they fail even once. Because of this, Marcella tells Vlad that he shouldn't let the chance, that comes once in a lifetime, slip out of his hands. She goes closer to him and holds him up by grabbing his shoulders, making her point very clear to him. And now back to the present, we see that our hero has a new look of determination on his face. Zemina, seeing that he's in pain, asks if he's okay and suggests that she should slow down to make it easier for him. However, Vlad refuses and insists that they have to keep moving. He refuses to allow himself to end things there. He wipes the beads of sweat on his face and prepares to get back to his feet with Zemina's help. Unfortunately, that's about the same time when one of their enemies spots them. He immediately alerts the others, revealing that he's found George's little minion who they've been looking for. All of a sudden, Vlad is filled with adrenaline and begins to run for his life, even though he was limping just a few seconds ago. Zemina runs as well, and the boy pulls her by the hand to ensure that he doesn't leave her behind. He urges her to run as fast as she can, and as the enemies pursue them with their swords, he thinks about how their home has been destroyed. Even if they were just two young birds, the time had come for them to soar into the sky on their own, since their nest is no more. They both manage to escape from their pursuers, leaving them confused. The killers with swords turn in circles, trying to figure out which way the kids went. But their efforts are futile. In frustration, one of them curses the kids, calling them little rats, while another suggests that they escaped into another alleyway. In the commotion, the leader of the gang suddenly orders the goons to inspect every corner, promising to reward them handsomely if they find the kids. The gang leader's face is revealed, and we see that it's the ponytail guy who Vlad humiliated back at the shop when Moneybug first arrived. Turns out, his little encounter with our hero cost him a few teeth. And because of that, he desperately wants to have his revenge. He wants Vlad to pay for the shame he made him feel back at the shop. Hearing that they would be rewarded, the men are re-motivated to keep searching. They decide to split up, believing that Vlad and Zemina couldn't have gone too far. 
unfortunately for them. In their haste, they run past the door where the kids are hiding behind. They don't even notice that it isn't locked. Meanwhile, Vlad and Zemina are hiding quietly behind it. The boy is holding his dagger while Zemina is covering her mouth with her hands, so her muffled cries don't give their position away. Vlad listens closely as the men who run past and continue searching. He reasons that they won't be able to escape with the way things are going, because it's only a matter of time before they get caught. As a result, he tells Zemina to go outside and escape, once things get quieter. As you'd expect, she's worried about him and asks him what he would do. Our hero explains that he needs to get out of there somehow and points out that it would be dangerous for them to move together since their pursuers are close by. However, Zemina doesn't think they should split up at all. She refuses the idea and tells Vlad that she wants to stay with him, reminding him of the promise he made to Marcella before they set out. Vlad vowed that he would take Zemina to a safe location before leaving her alone. He just tells her that she should go to the convent before sunrise, and if she's not okay with that, he also suggests that she can go to Harbin. Still, Zemina doesn't want to see things his way, and decides to throw a tantrum like a toddler, lamenting that she doesn't want to be separated. Vlad gets fed up at this point, so he snaps at her for never listening to anyone. He even calls her an idiot to make sure he gets his point across, explaining to her that he's not in a position to protect her at the moment. Speechless at the sudden outburst, the girl starts to cry. Just then, the consequence of their rather loud argument catches up to them. A man suddenly appears, demanding to know who's inside. Zemina panics, and immediately grabs a knife lying on the floor to defend herself if things get rough. The man finally reveals himself. He comes out of another room with a lamp, and we see that he's the blacksmith from earlier. He recognizes the kids, and asks them what they're doing there. Once again, Zemina starts to get on his nerves, calling him an old man and threatening him with the knife. With a very bored look on his face, the man hits back at her, asking her what the hell is wrong with her, and pointing out that she and Vlad are the ones intruding in his house. As usual, the girl doesn't even listen, and just insists that he doesn't move, threatening to stab him for real. The blacksmith matches her gaze, and notices that she's tearing up and frightened. He can tell that she's scared, so he tries to calm her down, explaining that he understands their situation. He calmly tells her to put the knife down, but she insists that he give her the sword that Vlad is always staring at. The blacksmith is confused hearing this, so Zemina makes it clear that she's dead serious, and for good measure, she also clarifies that it's the one he had hanging outside. She explains that they won't be safe outside the city either, and tells him one last time to give it to her because she isn't joking around with him. Vlad finally intervenes, telling her to put the knife down, but she just throws another tantrum, yelling at the blacksmith to bring out the sword. The blacksmith senses her desperation, and thinks about how this is the way things are in the slums. He believes that this is the true character of people who need to take something from others in order to survive. He thinks back to when he was younger, and admits to himself that he too was the same, so he's not surprised to see this girl acting in such a way. After a long pause, the blacksmith just tells Zemina that her situation is quite sad, hinting that he won't really help her. This makes her so mad, that she charges at him with the knife. The man sees that she's about to stab him, and closes his eyes like he's accepted his fate. Vlad also thinks that she's going to stab the man and calls out to her, but to their surprise, she just cuts her hair with the knife instead. The old man's eyes open wide at this scene, and with tears in her eyes, the poor girl offers him her red hair, claiming that she knows it's not enough to pay him, but promises to pay him back later. She begs the man to give Vlad the sword, and her desperation and concern is extremely clear in her eyes. The blacksmith is speechless, but then asks Vlad if he's leaving the slums. The boy confirms that to be the case, and the old man admits to himself that Vlad is going to finally achieve the one thing he could never do. He had dreamt of it all of his life, and he's now going to spread his wings. The blacksmith is touched by the kids, and although reluctant, he agrees to help them at the end. The scene shifts, and we see the old man carrying a wagon of dirt and trash, while Zemina wears a hood to disguise herself as she pushes it from behind. He tells her that it's the only way out of the city, even though she complains about the smell. Suddenly, some goons that the blacksmith recognizes confront them, asking him why he's taking out the trash at such a late hour. He immediately snaps at them, cursing them and reminding them that they were the ones who blocked all the alleyways with their stupid fight. He complains that his smithy is about to burst because he couldn't throw out the garbage earlier. The leader of the goons spots the hooded person behind the wagon, and gets suspicious because he knows the old man works alone. The blacksmith quickly explains that he was tired, so he gave the boy some bread to work for him. Of course, the guy doesn't buy the story and goes to investigate the person. He uses his knife to raise the hood, threatening to cut Zemina if she moves. When he raises it, he sees her short ginger hair. And when she also acts like a poor boy trying to make a living, he lets her off the hook. Before they leave, the old man asks what they're looking for, so they reveal that they're searching for George's blonde-haired kid's body. The blacksmith just scoffs and asks if they can be on their way now, but the guy claims that they have to be certain he's not helping the boy. 
so he tells his subordinate to check the wagon and asks the blacksmith to move it aside. At this point, the old man starts to wonder if they shouldn't have come this way, but remembers that there was nowhere else for them to go. The goon inspects the trash and admits that it's quite a lot. Suddenly, as he notices a hint of movement, he tells them not to hate him because it's his job, before proceeding to stab the heaps of dirt with his staff. The old man and Zemina are terrified when they see this, and Vlad, who's hiding under the dirt, is equally afraid. Out of nowhere, he starts mentioning that Harbin has put a boat out on the water, and he believes that he must have done it for a reason. He tells them to keep it in mind, and after stabbing the dirt, he says that he has now paid the debt of 40 silver coins that his young brother, Ned, owed him. The generous guy allows them to pass, and it appears he knew Vlad was in there, but let them leave the city anyway, because the boy had helped out his brother before. And now, Zemina and the blacksmith finally reach the outskirts of the town, where the trash is dumped into a channel that leads outside the walls. As they toss out the trash with Vlad in it, Zemina says her goodbyes, and the old man thinks about the star sword in the boy's hand. It was something he made with his dreams, and also something that was bought with the girl's tears. And now, it lays in the hands of a single boy, destined for a greater world. Outside the town, Vlad comes out of the dirt with the sword and starts to speak to the voice in his head. Holding the weapon, he asks if the voice can hear him, and it answers him with a yes. He then asks the voice who they are, but the voice doesn't seem to know. It's a bit baffling to our hero, because the voice knows so much about swords, but doesn't even know about itself. He decides that it's probably for the best, and offers to help the voice so it can help him as well. He offers to help the voice regain its memories, and asks it to be his sword in the future. At this point, Vlad doesn't even care if the person behind the voice is the devil, because whenever he pictures the insurmountable figure of God and who slaughtered his friends, he's already afraid that he might amount to nothing in this world. Hearing his determination, the voice tells our hero that he's finally going to tell him about his sword. After that, the scene shifts to somewhere in the snowy mountains, and we see a camp set up by soldiers, along with the banner of a noble family. A man seems to be moving chess pieces on a map, most likely strategizing for a battle. While doing so, he suddenly comments that this is too easy. This man happens to be Joseph Bayezid, the second son of the powerful Bayezid family. He looks intensely at the board and chess pieces, and once again says to himself that this is too easy. Finally, he's interrupted when one of his subordinates enters the room. The man greets Joseph, his young master, and informs him that he has just returned. Joseph addresses the man as Jaeger and greets him with excitement. The short-haired man sporting an eye patch stands before his master and notices that something is bothering him. He expresses his concern, and Joseph admits that it's because the battle seems far too easy. Hearing this, Jaeger proceeds to brief his young master on the recent monster subjugation. He explains that it has been going smoothly, and reveals that the number of casualties is small, they have only lost a few mercenaries. However, Joseph seems more concerned about the deserters. He fears that everyone would doubt his ability to command if there are deserters in his army. Joseph thinks that his father and the vassals are certainly going to think less of him, and as for his older stepbrother, Rudiger, he's sure that he would grasp at any opportunity to strike. Jaeger just stands there speechless, and Joseph ponders on what to do next. The young master thinks that there will be a lot of destruction if he can't become the next count, and if that happens, he already knows what his brother would do to the rest. He remembers how the Bayezid family has glorified the military for many years, and he knows this because his own father and blood brothers have continuously stepped on each other to gain such a position. The young master is aware that chaos is coming, and admits that he doesn't have enough swordsmen except for Jaeger. Hearing this, Jaeger steps forward, and reveals that he has something else he would like to tell him about. The young master's curiosity is piqued instantly, so he orders Jaeger to reveal whatever it is he wants to say. The loyal swordsman then tells him about a suspicious soldier among them, and Joseph surmises that it could be a spy sent by his brother. Jaeger agrees with the assumption, but claims that it's not the reason this particular soldier is suspicious. In fact, he thinks his master can only understand better if he sees his work for himself. The scene shifts, and we see the corpse of a goblin monster, probably killed by Joseph's soldiers. The young master looks at the creature, and seems rather disgusted by its corpse as he covers his nose. He takes a closer look at the goblins that are dangling from a wooden shed, and guesses that their injuries were probably inflicted by a child who just started wielding a sword. Jaeger takes Joseph to see more corpses, and upon seeing them, the young master is also unsatisfied by the kind of wounds he's seeing. Joseph thinks that all the injuries are poor, and claims that they're all the same. And then, he finally sees one that is a bit impressive. The goblin's torso has been sliced clean open, and after a while, he realizes that the wounds were all done by the same person. From the similarity between all of them, Joseph surmises that all the monsters were killed by the same person, so he asks Jaeger just to be sure. The one-eyed soldier confirms the theory, and reveals that the corpses he's currently looking at only came here yesterday, and he explains to Joseph that the ones he saw earlier were killed a month ago. 
The young master is shocked to hear this and almost doesn't believe that someone who made such poor cuts would have perfected his swing in just a single month. Even though he thinks it's impossible, he can't help but ask Jaeger about this person. The scene shifts, and the next thing we see is a group of men slaughtering a horde of goblins in the snowy forest. The goblins surround one of the men, but he holds his own against them by wielding his spiked club and fighting off the ones he can. One of the other men shouts for them to tighten their formation so they can make sure the monsters don't escape. Just then, a man holding a spear appears. He steps on one of the goblin corpses and tells the other men that he can see the end, encouraging them to get the rest of the goblins fast. However, rather than being motivated, the other soldiers are horrified because they suddenly see a giant red-eyed hobgoblin standing behind the man and preparing to kill him. The guy gets confused when he sees the look on their faces and wonders what's going on. Unfortunately, before he can ask or be told what's happening, the giant monster smashes him with its wooden club. The force of the smash is so great that it sends a lot of snow flying in the air. When the snow settles back, the other soldiers see that the goblin has bashed the guy's head into the ground. Even though they are scared out of their minds, they try their best to stay brave and fight the urge to run for their lives. The creature roars at them, but they still don't run away, so it charges at them in rage and begins its onslaught. As it kills them one by one, the men wonder where the crazy monster even came from. When the guys at the back see that the monster has broken through their fifth group, they finally start to retreat. However, their fat old commander orders them to hurry up and go forward to contain the beast. The man reminds them that they won't be paid if they retreat, but the mercenaries reply, telling him that they didn't know they would have to face such a monster. They tell the commander that he should have contacted expensive mercenaries instead, or better still, they ask him to fight the monster himself. Enraged, the commander tries to force them back into the battlefield by threatening them, but before he can pull out his sword, the hobgoblin kills the man he was trying to scare right in front of him. Seeing the monster up close, the commander sits on his horse, knowing that he's probably going to get killed as well. Just then, a man walks out from among the mercenaries and starts walking towards the ferocious beast. The other men look shocked and confused at first, but then identify the brave man as the praying Rimmon. They might know this blonde swordsman is Rimmon, but we know that he's actually our boy Vlad. He bravely tells them that he would take on the monster by himself, and as you'd expect, nobody seems to oppose him. The hobgoblin sees Vlad walking toward it and charges at him right away. Our hero also braces himself for the fight, and as the beast reaches him, he quickly slashes its side with his sword. However, he could immediately tell that the cut was shallow. That oversight gets him distracted for a bit, but the voice in his head tells him to dodge before the goblin can smash him with its club. Regaining his senses, Vlad manages to dodge the series of heavy attacks by the monster. As he skids back to a halt while knocking up the snow, he admits that he failed in his attack earlier. The voice starts reprimanding him for it, calling him stupid for not being able to do it even after he was told what to do. Still, our boy knows better that it's almost impossible to perform a new move after only hearing about it once. Anyway, he gets back to his feet, and as the goblin charges at him again, he explains that he's just taking the long route in the fight. The hobgoblin swings its giant club at him once again, and once again, Vlad manages to dodge it just like before. The monster gets frustrated after missing so many times and attempts to unleash a powerful slam on him to finish things off for good. It smashes the club on the ground, causing a huge snow explosion, but when the snow clears, it realizes that it missed once again. The bamboozled creature just stands there in shock, and in that moment of vulnerability, Vlad takes the opportunity to finally cut the monster properly with his sword. As he stretches his arms, the sword begins to glow, and by the time the monster sees him coming, it's already too late for it to survive. The panel shifts back to Jaeger and Joseph, where Jaeger informs the young master that the person responsible is called the Praying Rimmon. Joseph finds the name intriguing and asks his one-eyed subordinate to investigate this soldier immediately. Of course, the swordsman takes the instruction without hesitation, and as he places a hand on his chest and bows his head, he assures his master that he will carry out the investigation without delay. After Jaeger leaves, Joseph remains in one spot. He stares at the goblin corpses that have been cut open, thinking about how they were killed because in his mind, it doesn't make any sense at all. From the cuts on the goblin corpses that were brought in one month ago, he could tell that the swings were crooked and sloppy. Joseph finds it difficult to believe that they were done by the same person, because it shouldn't be possible for anyone to master the path of the sword in only one month. A small smile appears on Joseph's face as he wonders whether the boy in question is a true genius of this era. That's when the panels take us back to our hero, finally slicing clean the torso of his enemy. His eyes are ice cold, and it's clear that he has already stepped onto the path of a true sword master. Elsewhere in the snowy mountains, we see the mercenaries loading up the many hobgoblin corpses on their wagons. One of them talks about how his side of the place is filled with the trash, and another admits that it's the same on his end. 
Apparently, the mercenaries thought that there would be treasure somewhere around because of the many hobgoblins that were in the forest. One of the men calls out to Vlad, who's now going by the name Rimen and also happens to be their captain. The mercenary praises Vlad for his impressive display during his battle with the giant hobgoblin. It's not a surprise, however, because it seems Vlad always does great during their encounters with monsters. The guy keeps showering Vlad with praise but he doesn't seem to care. In fact, he's a bit irritated by the guy's chattering, so he tells him to stop talking and just focus on loading up his kills. Vlad's latest fan reveals that he already did that and points out that no one would even dare to take his kills for themselves anyway. The man asks Vlad what they're going to do next, explaining that they're almost done with the work on the ground. Feeling excited, he asks Vlad if he would like to do any other work with him. The look on our boy's face shows that he's not interested, but the fan is eager to try his luck. He's about to tell Vlad what a great team they would make by combining his brains and Vlad's swordsmanship, but Vlad bluntly cuts him off, stating that he doesn't believe in working with frauds. Hearing this, the guy is speechless and also offended. After a brief pause, he tells Vlad that he can't keep using the mercenary plaque, and then proceeds to try his luck again. He's about to tell him about a good blacksmith that he knows, but once again, Vlad angrily shuns him. He gets upset and calls the guy by name to show that he isn't messing around. Vlad tells the guy, whose name is Goth, that blabbering can get people killed. He decides at the back of his mind that he would warn him if what he's about to say is just a suggestion. However, if it's some kind of threat, our hero makes up his mind that he'll kill Goth. Seeing how pissed off he is, Goth treads with caution and explains that he was only trying to say that Vlad should be earning a lot more than some petty change, especially when he's so skilled. Since it was just a suggestion, Vlad tells Goth to shut up and keep cleaning, warning him that he will lose his head if he doesn't. The terrified fanboy quickly heeds Vlad's not-so-friendly advice and runs away before he gets decapitated. After Goth leaves, Vlad ponders what he said and decides that he'll have to do something about the stalker soon. The men continue loading up the wagons with the bloody goblin corpses while our hero walks away from there. Vlad starts walking into the woods and the other mercenaries suspect that he might be going to pray again. For some reason, it appears that our boy always goes to pray in the forest, amazing the men by his consistency. Inside the forest, we see him going on one knee and planting his sword into the ground. The other mercenaries peek at him and talk about how cool he looks in that posture. Some even think that he might actually be a noble. Even if he isn't, they don't believe that someone like him could have been born into the same class as them. In reality, Vlad isn't praying at all. Rather, he's being scolded intensely by the voice in his sword. He berates himself for not being able to cut off the giant hobgoblin with a single strike, and sure enough, the voice calls him a fool. The voice reminds Vlad that the one-hit, one-kill technique lies in the element of surprise. Vlad is too bummed to even try to interpret it so he just asks the voice what he even means by that. Seeing that is reluctant to use his brain for it, the voice gives him a very lame explanation like something you'd tell a toddler. Still, Vlad doesn't seem to understand and the voice gets frustrated. The voice reiterates that Vlad is supposed to go wham when the opponent goes whoosh, but still he doesn't understand. And honestly, you can't blame him. As he struggles to interpret what the voice is telling him, the other mercenaries watch him in awe, still thinking that he's praying. The next morning, back at the soldiers' camp, we see them walking around and going about their business after setting up their tents for the night. Soon, it's time for breakfast and Vlad is served a very questionable bowl of soup just like the other mercenaries. The other men dig in immediately, but he is reluctant to eat, afraid that it's not good. He's not even sure that the meat in the soup is actually meat, so he asks the others what kind it is. Goth replies with his mouth full of the food, and simply claims that he doesn't know and doesn't care since it's free. He explains to Vlad that as mercenaries, they have a very hard time finding employers who would provide them with meals for free. One of the other men at the table points out that it's not much of a surprise their bosses could afford it, since they're the Bayezids after all. Another chimes in, commenting that the food is salty, but admits that it's better than having nothing to eat. Despite their attempts to make Vlad more appreciative or even eat the food, he refuses to join them. He just gets up from the table, leaves his food, and tells the other mercenaries to enjoy it since they're okay with it. As Vlad walks out of the place, the other men wonder if he's going to see the priest again. Another thinks that he should even start praying like him too, probably thinking it would make him better with the sword. Unfortunately for him, one of his colleagues dashes his hopes, bluntly telling him that he's never going to be like the praying Rimen. A while later, Vlad arrives at the priest's tent. The priest who looks like Albert Einstein in a way, is delighted to see our hero. Vlad greets the dude and addresses him as Father Andreas. He then asks if he had a good night's rest, and the priest assures him that he did, like always. Father Andreas reveals that he heard Vlad was praying last night in the woods, and comments that it must have been very cold out there. It seems everyone thinks Vlad is some kind of devotee. They have no idea that he's taking secret lessons from the voice in his head. It also appears that Vlad is deceiving all of them, including the priest.
he's making it look like he's very religious, but in truth, he's only learning the most effective ways to kill with a sword. Vlad tells Father Andreas that he didn't feel cold because he was in the embrace of God, and the old priest laughs in response, claiming that Vlad is more like a priest than he is. Just then, a little priest in training named Jean enters the room and informs Father Andreas that his meal is ready. Father Andreas thanks Jean and asks Vlad to join him for breakfast. He holds the young man's shoulders, making him sit in a chair, and on the table, there's a scrumptious steaming breakfast. Vlad tries to refuse, explaining that he didn't come to eat, but Father Andreas just ignores him and takes his seat. Jean does the same, and when everyone is seated, the priest starts the prayer. Jean closes his eyes like the innocent kid he is, but Vlad has his eyes wide open. Father Andreas sneakily opens one eye to check what he is doing, but when he does, he sees him praying with his eyes closed. Seeing this, he thinks that Vlad is an honest believer who hasn't lost faith even in such a lowly place. Father Andreas believes that he needs to lead the young man, who he knows will always taint his hands with blood during battle. He believes that it's his duty and a fate that God has charged him with. The priest finishes the thought and closes the prayer as well. Then, he says that they can eat, and Vlad thanks him for the prayer. On the table is some rare wheat bread and some soup. Upon seeing this, Vlad is delighted that he can finally eat real food, instead of the strange concoction that the other mercenaries are eating. He is about to take his first bite when Father Andreas interrupts him, asking about his swordsmanship. He claims that he's heard a lot about it, and reveals that Sir Joseph Bayezid might also have heard about it. Father Andreas tells Vlad that Sir Jaeger visited him two days ago to ask about the blonde-haired swordsman. Hearing this, our hero gets a bit nervous, so he asks the priest to go on with his story. Andreas smiles sheepishly at Vlad, and tells him that after Sir Jaeger came to see him, he recommended him to the main troops, telling him that he looks forward to seeing how Vlad would grow up. Vlad is less than pleased to hear this. In fact, he even seems worried. The innocent priest goes on to tell him about the Bayezid family. He explains that they're a renowned family in the north, and points out that just being able to work for them will put him in a much better environment than the one he's currently in. After the chat with the priest, Vlad becomes very uncomfortable. He goes back into the snowy forest where he allegedly prays, and laments to the voice in his head. He's afraid that he might have drawn too much attention to himself by being so good with the sword. However, the voice tells him that they didn't have a choice, because his kind of swordsmanship can only be learned through real experience. The voice then tells the boy that the real problem started when he got too close to the priest, but our hero just quietly states that he did it because he had to be sure the voice wasn't an evil spirit. The voice already knows what Vlad is implying, and asks him if he's finally gotten his answer now that everything has gone south. Still, Vlad just thinks back to the reason he befriended the priest in the first place. Father Andreas is said to be someone who is reputable, and also possesses great divine power, so much so that he was offered the title of the bishop. He thinks that if someone is spiritually inclined as the priest couldn't sense anything off about him, then he's probably sure that the voice isn't evil. Either way, that's currently not the main concern at hand. Vlad asks if they should run off before Sir Joseph comes looking for him, and the voice suggests that the Bayezid family might turn a blind eye to his false identity, since he's a very skilled swordsman. Even if that happens by some miracle, Vlad fears that they will eventually find out he killed a mercenary for stealing. When that happens, he'll be charged with faking his identity and murder at the same time. The voice uses this opportunity to taunt Vlad, telling him that he's pretty evil after all. The boy quickly snaps at the voice talking through the sword, and reminds him that he's also an accomplice to those crimes. Seeing that the odds are against them, the voice suggests that running away would be the better option, pointing out that the excuse of self-defense only works when one has a witness. Hearing this, Vlad agrees that they would both run away at night. He also suggests that they take gold with them so that they can obtain a fake plaque. The plan sounds very difficult to the voice, and he expresses his concern to Vlad. But just then, the voice senses someone approaching from behind. From the aura the person is giving off, the voice confirms that the person is an advanced knight at the very least. Vlad swiftly turns around, grabs his sword, and goes into battle mode at once. However, when he does, we see that the person is actually Sir Jaeger. The green-eyed knight is surprised that Vlad could sense his presence, and admits that the guy is even better than he anticipated. Our hero maintains a fighting stance, while Jaeger informs him that Sir Joseph would like to see him. Hearing this, Vlad thinks that he should have booked the meeting himself while he had the chance, because now, he'll be in big trouble if he doesn't act properly before Sir Joseph. Even though he's very nervous, the boy calmly tells Sir Jaeger that he's honored to be summoned by the young master. Vlad decides to play the poker face, knowing it's an undeniable skill in a card game. Sir Jaeger asks Vlad if he was expecting him, and the young swordsman tells him that he found out from Father Andreas, but admits that he didn't think he would come so soon. Seeing the boy's confidence, Sir Jaeger finds it interesting that such a young kid isn't intimidated by him at all. And then, he asks the boy to follow behind him. When he turns his back, Vlad contemplates making a break for it, 
but the voice tells him not to try it because a knight of Jaeger's level could kill him before he can even take three steps. Vlad accepts his fate when he realizes that he has no choice, so he obediently follows the knight. A while later, they arrive at Sir Joseph's tent, and the young master reveals that he's pleased to finally meet the popular praying Rimmon. Vlad bows his head, stating that it's an honor to meet the second son of the Bayezid family. The young master asks Vlad if there are any inconveniences with his work, and he replies that all the mercenaries are thankful for his consideration. Sir Joseph finally addresses the issue of Vlad's blonde hair and blue eyes, claiming that he used to think he was the son of some fallen noble family. So just to be sure, he asks Vlad if his name is actually Rimmon, and without any doubt, our hero confirms. Just then, Joseph closes the blue book he was reading, and tells Vlad that he should have told him the truth. Suddenly, Sir Jaeger lands a mighty slap on our boy's face, and the young master reveals that he hates liars. The blonde swordsman wipes his cheek as Sir Jaeger stares him down, and in a surprising twist, Sir Joseph reveals that he knows our hero is actually someone named Vlad from the city of Soara. Vlad rubs his chin to reduce the pain from the hard slap, and tries to act unfazed by the fact that the young master knows his true identity. Sir Joseph reveals that from his research, it's been confirmed that Vlad's mother was an unmarried woman, however, they couldn't find out anything about his father. The young master then asks Vlad if he knows who his father is by any chance. Naturally, our hero gets offended, and rudely tells Joseph that he's very funny for asking the son of an unmarried woman if he knows who his father is. The next thing we see is Sir Jaeger kicking his leg and sweeping him off the floor. Vlad falls to the floor groaning in pain, and the angry advanced knight tells him not to forget his manners. The boy scowls at Sir Jaeger with anger, but doesn't say anything in response. Sir Joseph suddenly intervenes, saying that there should be no need for violence. He admits that his question was pretty funny, even though it was also insensitive. The young master walks toward Vlad and stands over him. He says that he already knows why Vlad ran away from Soara, and then asks the young swordsman to tell them where he learned to wield a sword. Vlad stays mute and just scowls at Joseph. The young master looks into Vlad's angry blue eyes and claims that they are hiding way too much. Suddenly, Sir Jaeger pulls out his sword and attempts to strike our hero from behind. He quickly senses the imminent danger and bites his lip, before reluctantly revealing that he had a teacher who trained him how to use the sword. Vlad, still on one knee, tells Joseph that the mysterious teacher came to him and then disappeared like lightning. Joseph is surprised to hear this, but Vlad continues to tell him more. He tells Joseph that the teacher didn't disclose his name and only told him about a lone man's ever-winning secret, never to be disclosed to anyone else. Vlad says this while staring intensely at Joseph, and seeing his face, the young master is taken aback because of how unwavering the kid's gaze is. After a brief pause, Joseph just says okay and apologizes to Vlad for the rough treatment. Hearing this, Vlad starts to wonder if his clever lie worked. The young master interrupts his thoughts, explaining that he's currently in a very tight spot. As a result of this, he's decided to make Vlad of Soara an offer and asks the blonde swordsman if he doesn't want to rise to a higher place. He suddenly starts saying things that grab Vlad's attention. From power to freedom, survival, and knighthood, Joseph tells Vlad that he can give him all of these things. Our hero just looks up in awe as the second son of the powerful Bayezid family tells him that he would like to offer his support. The scene shifts, and the next thing we see is two men clashing wooden swords. They're sparring with each other, and we quickly realize that it's the advanced knight training Vlad. Meanwhile, the other mercenaries watch in admiration as two skilled swordsmen spar. One of them wonders how the young kid is holding his own against the experienced knight, but another just comments that Jaeger is definitely going easy on Vlad. Regardless, they all admit that Vlad is exceptionally skilled and envy him, claiming that he's so lucky since he is already set for a blossoming future. The fight persists, and we find out that Vlad truly doesn't give Sir Jaeger a hard time at all. The knight calls Vlad an arrogant brat for talking to Sir Joseph without respect, when he only has average skills to show for it. And then, Sir Jaeger starts to flex his superiority by holding one hand behind his back and swinging with the other. He effortlessly gives Vlad a very tough time, and tells him that he's an arrogant brat who doesn't know his place. As Vlad struggles to keep up with Sir Jaeger's barrage of attacks, he admits in his mind that the knight is truly on a different level. He's very confused at this point, because if he just dodges Jaeger's attack, the knight simply follows up with another right after. And when that happens, it's too forceful for him to block. Vlad decides that since that's the case, he would need to take a different approach. As such, the next time Jaeger swings at him, he blocks it quickly before slipping his sword underneath Jaeger's own. After setting his sword free, Vlad prepares to unleash a powerful strike, and you can tell he's serious because his eyes start to glow. Jaeger blocks it with his sword, but the spectators start to cheer him on, seeing that he managed to pull off such an impressive skill. The knight taunts Vlad, telling him that he should manage that attempt at least, since it's his best one. However, the exhausted Vlad thinks that he didn't even succeed in his attempt. Instead, he believes that Sir Jaeger just allowed him to land a blow. 
The knight finally ends the grueling session and tells Vlad that he would have to spar like this twice a day, morning and evening. The boy is horrified to hear this because he knows how difficult it was to survive one session. Vlad is still shaken by what he just heard, but in his dazed state, Sir Jaeger just starts walking away, informing him that it's a wrap for the morning sparring session, telling him not to cool down too much. When Sir Jaeger leaves the scene, Vlad starts to gossip with the voice. He claims that the knight is non-committal and points out how he didn't even give him a single piece of advice. The voice simply chimes in, praising Sir Jaeger's remarkable swordsmanship and reminding Vlad that the knight ruthlessly chopped away all of his superfluous movements. After that, the voice tells Vlad that he can only become better by getting hit every once in a while. Hearing this, Vlad just laments that no one is on his side, no matter where he goes. Back in Joseph's tent, Sir Jaeger arrives to give his report, and the young master asks him what he thinks about Vlad after seeing his skills for himself. The loyal knight admits that they can use Vlad to their advantage, explaining that the young swordsman is at a point where he would even get the attention of the count if he was a noble. Hearing this, Joseph is now sure that his judgments were correct. But even though Vlad is obviously skilled and a valuable asset, Sir Jaeger points out an issue. According to him, the problem with Vlad is that he's arrogant and also doesn't know his place. However, Joseph claims that such traits are to be expected because he grew up in the rough back alleys in the slums. He also points out that etiquette can be taught well if done slowly. With this in mind, Joseph tells Jaeger that he believes he is the right man for the job. Jaeger is speechless upon hearing this and visibly reluctant to accept the role of teaching Vlad manners. He tells the young master that a disloyal sword cannot be trusted, and Joseph admits that even though Vlad bowed his head the moment he saw him, he still didn't trust him. As such, he would prefer that the allegedly arrogant kid shows his true nature and have him show what's on the inside instead of pretending. Meanwhile, elsewhere, we see Vlad looking very enraged, claiming that he has something he must do no matter what. Joseph believes that Sir Jaeger taking Vlad under his tutelage is probably for the best, because a relationship where both parties involved want something from each other might just be better. Even though Jaeger isn't fully in support of the plan, he has no choice but to do as his master commands. Joseph feels like Vlad isn't even quite the wolf, he simply believes that the kid is cocky, untrustworthy, and full of himself. He tells Jaeger not to rush anything, because he'll need time to build a huge metaphorical cage for Vlad. He wants the cage to be so big that the wolf in this case, Vlad, would eventually think he's been freed when he's still under their control. Later that evening, some of the mercenaries head out into the cold forests. The men are still finding it difficult to come to terms with the fact that their former captain is now serving under Sir Jaeger. Doth regrets not charming his way to get Jaeger's attention when he had the chance. He thinks that Vlad is very lucky to have found his way out of the expedition team, especially now that the weather has become unbearably cold. His brooding is cut short when the new captain, Sir Roderick, scolds him and orders him to get his acts together so he can do his job well. Doth doesn't like this stuck-up captain at all and thinks that he only just patrolled by so he wouldn't have to check on him for a long while. He decides to get some sleep, but is immediately woken up when he hears Roderick's voice. Goth sees him talking with a woman, who claims that she's looking for her kid. Roderick tells the woman that she must be crazy, because there are no kids here. However, all of a sudden, he stops talking, and the sudden silence makes Goth get worried. He fearfully goes to check what happened to the captain, but when he gets close, Roderick suddenly starts walking in the opposite direction which leads out of camp. Goth is horrified when he sees a dirty aura surrounding Roderick's body as he walks deeper into the forest like he's been possessed. The chapter ends here, but I'm left hanging to figure out what happens next. What was that woman's voice from earlier? And what could possibly have possessed Roderick? Also, how is Joseph planning to use our hero in the future? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode. Until next time.